John Perry, great to see you again. Thanks so much for coming back on Evolution Soup all the way from your home in Canada. For anyone watching this in the future, we're recording this during the infamous coronavirus lockdown of March 2020. And viruses are exactly what we're going to be talking about today. But uh, beavering away at home is what you do anyway, right? Uh, working on science animations for the Stated Clearly YouTube channel. Yeah, not a whole lot has changed for me with the lockdown, except for that uh, I don't get to go out in the evenings. Or, uh, yeah, it's a little bit weirder going to the grocery store. But other than that, yeah, mm. um, I, I do miss hanging out with my friends in real life. But we've been doing it on Skype and stuff, so it's things are going pretty well. Okay, the subject of viruses is very topical at the moment, and people are more interested in ever in trying to understand viruses and what they are. You've recently completed a new animation on viruses, which we'll talk about soon, and as we'll see, they are a tremendous proof of evolution. But I think the best place to start is, John, what exactly is a virus? Well, there's kind of there's two ways to think about it. There's kind of like a layperson's way to think about of it, and then a very technical way to think of a virus. So let me just start with the layperson's, and that would be, you know, a virus is the hmm. smallest infecting agent, infecting organism that most people will ever have to worry about. There are things that are smaller, like uh, there are viroids, virusoids, and there are um, prions. But a virus is really the only thing that most people will ever have to worry about. They're significantly smaller than bacteria. So hundreds of them can fit inside of a single bacterial cell. There are actually more species of virus than there are of any other organism. But they, most of them don't infect humans. Only certain ones can infect humans. Lots of them infect uh, specific bacteria or they'll infect specific plants and so on. So there's just a, a really small number that we really, us humans really have to worry about. Mm. Uh, so that's kind of how you, sh you should think of them in general, you know, uh, if you're not a biologist. But biologists uh, will classify a virus as an organism that codes for protein. So it has genes that code for protein, but it does not have a ribosome. So it cannot build its own protein. And that means that it is an obligate parasite. It has to infect a cell of some kind and hijack its machinery, use its ribosome in order to build its own proteins so that it can reproduce. And so this is why, yeah, this is why viruses infect organisms. It's because they need that ribosome to reproduce. Mm. And I suppose we can't really avoid talking about the virus of the moment, the fast spreading coronavirus, otherwise known as COVID-19. For anyone who doesn't know or who still isn't quite certain, how would you describe COVID-19 and how does it operate? Yes. So COVID-19 is, uh, there's a lot of confusion around the naming of this because COVID-19 mm. uh, specifically is the, the disease and the virus that causes it is SARS-CoV-2. But the World Health Organization, when uh, when the virus was first named, they didn't like that name because they thought people would be uh. scared of, of the word SARS because we had this uh, scare a few years ago with the SARS outbreak. Right. So they started calling it the COVID-19 virus. So you'll see, if, if you read scientific papers, you, you read about SARS-CoV-2. If you read the media or anything from the World Health Organization, it's usually COVID-19 virus. But uh, that's important if you're trying to follow this in the, in the literature, scientific literature. Yeah. But this virus is new to humans. Uh, we think right now that it evolved from a virus that existed previously in bats in China. So there's these, uh, uh, there's there's a, a group of bats in in Asia and all through throughout the Middle East that have a lot of different coronaviruses in them. So coronaviruses, they're a large family of viruses. There's actually four coronaviruses that humans have. That we get them all the time, and it's not a big deal. There's, uh, they cause just the common cold. So we're already familiar with coronaviruses. 
our bodies are already familiar with them. But this one is new. It's one that our bodies have never seen. It jumped over very recently, uh, possibly as early as October, but uh, probably November of uh, 2019. It jumped over into humans from bats and probably through an intermediate species. We're thinking right now, maybe it was the pangolin because pangolins are used oh, for yeah. a lot of uh, medicines and rituals in China, which is where the, the virus first jumped over uh, so far as we can tell. And so, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's making the round through the human population. And because it's new to us, we are not immune to it. So it's spreading. Mm unchecked essentially and it's causing pneumonia in some people so most people who get it are fine it's basically the common cold or less for most people but for about uh, 20 percent of the people who get it they start to have this really bad uh, respiratory infection in the lungs that causes troubles breathing until finally sometimes people need to get put on ventilators in order to breathe so you know have a machine breathing for them for a while and of course, some people are not even recovering at all. So it's a uh, pretty scary, <laughs> and it's yeah. shutting down economies everywhere. And yeah, it's it's quite quite insane. John, what is the best way for a person to defend themselves against COVID nineteen? Different governments are, have different recommendations. A lot of uh, so early on, some of the the governments in in China and Korea were recommending that everybody wear a face mask. Uh, mm. It doesn't seem that that's super. Uh, useful to avoid getting it, but it is helpful if you have it and you don't want to spread it to other people in your house or whatever. But the best way to avoid getting it is to just <laughs> do what, what people have called social distancing, which is you just stay home. You don't go into crowded places and you wash your hands every time you have to leave the house. If you go to the grocery store or whatever, wash your hands very thoroughly with soap and water when you get back and don't touch your face when you're out and about because what this virus does is it it infects the respiratory tract. So it's actually mm -hmm. getting inside your cells and reproducing inside of your cells in your mouth, in your nose, in your trachea, and in your lungs. And so if you have it, when you breathe out, uh, little tiny water particles with the virus in them will come out of your mouth. And those will land on things if you touch things and then touch your face. Uh, and someone else breathed on those objects. So maybe you're in the grocery store. Right. Uh, if you touch your face, you can then get the virus. It can get into your eyes. It can get into your mouth and so on. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the trick to try and stay safe. I think one of the things that you demonstrated in your, your recent video is that uh, the virus is covered in kind of like a fat layer and soap breaks that down. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So th this, this virus, if we look at the anatomy of it, it's, it's got one chromosome. So it's got a big long chain of RNA and that is surrounded by protein. So it's, it's strengthened by a kind of a protein shell. And then around that we have a fatty layer. Uh, it's essentially a cell membrane, uh, a, a, a little fatty membrane that can easily be broken apart by soap. So, this virus, if you dry it out, it will break. If you, if you really dry it out, it'll break apart. If you hit it with soap, it'll break apart. If you hit it with alcohol, uh, high amounts of alcohol, it will break apart, uh, you know, like rubbing alcohol and so on. So it's pretty easy to kill. It's, it's pretty fragile, luckily for us. And it doesn't stay a airborne very long because uh, – it needs to be inside these these water particles in order to stay intact. If it completely dries out, it will break apart. Mm -hmm. And these water particles, right. the ones that we normally breathe out and cough out, are usually too big to stay in the air very long. They'll they'll fall towards the ground. Uh, in colder, drier climates, they will start to evaporate, and they can actually stay in, in the air for quite a bit of time. But eventually, they'll evaporate so much that uh, they'll just the virus will will break apart. So thank goodness for that. It's not, uh, it's not nearly mm. as transmissible as other viruses in the past, like uh, smallpox and so on, but it's uh, yeah, Please it's still, mm. <laughs> yeah, it's still problematic. Right. We mentioned earlier that viruses are proof of evolution and that's basically because in order to survive, it has to evolve. Is that right? Yeah. Well, 
in order to jump from one species to another, a virus, it does have to evolve. So hmm. viruses are extremely simple. As I mentioned before, they are, they are the simplest, smallest entities that can evolve and reproduce that, that, that we generally have to worry about. And they're so simple, in fact, that they usually have to specialize in just one species. So you can think of your body as a very different environment than your dog's body, even though you're so similar to your dog. Our, our bodies are different enough that a virus adapted to a dog has major issues when it comes in, inside the body of a human. It just, mm. it can't, it can't do the things that it's supposed to do. So this virus in particular, it sticks to proteins on the outside of our cells. So the virus is covered in these little things that we call spike proteins that have what's essentially a, a little um, customized Velcro system on the outside of this of the virus. And it, so it doesn't stick to most things. Otherwise, it just gets stuck to the first thing it comes in contact with and it wouldn't mm. be able to, to, to do anything. So it doesn't stick to most things, but it's, it sticks really well to a very specific protein on the outside of our cells, a protein that our, our lungs have in them, our lung cells. And these are proteins that our lung cells use for very specific tasks. It's called the ACE2 protein. And uh, this virus sticks to that protein, the ACE2 protein, extremely well. And it just, mm. it'll stick to the cell and it'll just wait for the cell to swallow it because your cell is constantly swallowing things that are stuck to its surface. This is how it gets food in. It's how it gets uh, water in and other things. So the cell will actually just periodically swallow things that are stuck to its surface. The virus is hanging out there just waiting. It gets swallowed and then it opens up and it spills its genome into your cells and then it starts making copies of itself. So that's how the virus infects us. And the proteins on the outside of our cells are slightly different than the proteins on the outsides of your dog cells, on the, on the outsides of a bat cells. They're slightly different. They are, because we're all mammals, they, they are fairly close. Those proteins are fairly closely related, but their structures are a little bit different. And so to stick to a bat's ACE2 um, protein, you need to be a slightly different shape. Your Velcro needs to be slightly different than to stick to a human's ACE2 protein. And so what happened uh, is somehow there was enough contact between either humans and bats or most likely humans and another intermediate species, we think the pangolin, that you know every time a virus is reproducing, mutations occur. And some of these mutations can actually change the shape of that spike protein. And a mm -hmm. slight change in that spike protein can make it so that it sticks really well to a different animal's ACE2 protein. And this is what happened in this case. Uh, it, it's the, the current virus can no longer stick very well to bats' ACE2 proteins, but it sticks extremely well to humans. And so what would have happened there is you would have had a virus was mutated and was lucky mm -hmm. enough, just so lucky enough that it got into a... It, it's it had changed randomly so it could it could attach to a human protein and it happened to come across a human at that same time so the, basically the stars had to align for this to happen but oh, it happened in a way that this was able to occur and these these evolutionary events these we call them spillover events where a virus mutates and is able to infect a new host mm -hmm. these these are very rare uh events but because there are billions of humans and because humans interact with animals all the time especially through the, the food industry meat and so on there are lots of opportunities for extremely rare events to happen and so this is this is a very clear case of evolution where a virus was able to jump from one host to another host because of a mutation that occurred in its spike proteins Coronaviruses are not the only types of animal viruses that can adapt to new hosts. HIV spilled over from chimps, most likely when someone cut themselves while preparing chimp meat for dinner. The swine flu came partly from pigs, but we think it actually evolved through a recombination with a pig virus and a bird virus. The 1918 Spanish flu, the big one that devastated populations all around the world, may have spilled over from chickens.
Your newest science animation for Stated Clearly is entitled Where Do New Viruses Come From, which, uh, as you have said, has gone viral. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. clocked up uh, nearly 3 million views, or perhaps over 3 million views now since it's uploaded at the end of February. It shows just what viruses are and specifically what a coronavirus is and where they come from. John, can you just take us through the, the prep for this animation. I know you have a lot of contacts in the science world. I'm assuming you got help from one or more experts, perhaps uh, some of the country's leading uh, virologists, maybe? <laughs> so normally when I'm doing an animation, I have lots of time to get it ready. And I've got enough contacts in the scientific community that I can usually find someone who can help tutor me on a specific topic. But that was not the case here. The pandemic was starting. It was, it was mm -hmm. going strong in China. And I suspected that it might come here. And I just dropped all my other projects and focused fully on this animation uh, so that I could, I, could, I could try and get this out as or before it was coming to the United States and to, and to uh, Europe uh, because I knew people would have lots of questions. And everyone that I contacted was busy <laughs> because everybody was working on this. Um, this is a problem. Uh, with virology in general. I've, I've done videos on HIV in the past. And aside from people being uh, extremely busy uh, when when they're working on things like virology, they are uh, also very cautious with talking to the media because, especially YouTubers, right? Because there are so many conspiracy theories surrounding viruses. So it was awesome. actually really hard to get a hold of anyone. And I, I was not able to get anyone to look through this video before I published it. Luckily, the literature is super clear on viruses. We had this SARS outbreak, which was also a coronavirus uh, a few years back. And there was a bunch of really clear literature on that uh, that I was just able to dive into. So now I'm, uh, I'm, it would probably be easy for me now that this video is up and has all this attention. It'd probably be a lot easier for me to get uh, some virologists to to look at my work and help me on the next project. But um, mm -hmm. it, there is this issue with uh, the conspiracy theories surrounding viruses that it makes it very hard to get a researcher in this field to, to trust mm -hmm. you because they, they've been drug, drug through the mud so many times. This, this was really just me and the literature. <laughs> um, <laughs> To, to make this animation, but I'm, I'm very, very pleased with, with how it turned out. Uh, everything in it has, has held up strong, you know? Uh, yeah, it's one of your best, definitely. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And the the uh, the information, unfortunately, we don't have new information yet. In the, in the animation, I was talking about how we think that it, this might have come from pangolins, but we're not yet sure. And that, unfortunately, is still where we're at. We're, we're still... Uh, not totally sure that it came from pangolins. Mm. And I'm not saying penguins, I'm saying pangolins, which is this uh, uh, little anteater, scaly anteater type animal that lives you know, in China Armadillo things that sort of grown up and roll up into a bowl occasionally. Yeah, yeah. They're really cool little animals. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, pangolins are used for, uh, well, they're used as meat. I mean, you know, it, mm. it's an animal, so people eat it. But also their scales are used in uh, uh, Chinese medicine and their blood is used to bless the construction of buildings. And for some reason, there's a lot of folk magic in, in certain parts of China uh, that still uses that. So they, they sacrifice pangolins when they're building a, a building, which is, uh, you know, puts humans in contact with pangolins and is this is an endangered species. And then uh, the, the Chinese medicine, the scales are believed to, to be useful for a whole bunch of different uh, medicinal purposes. Mm. And we actually don't, Western science really hasn't looked into it. So we don't know if it works or not, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, it's a big problem because, you know, China's trying to, been tr trying to, trying to fight this for a long time, the Chinese government. Uh, mm. It's the, the illegal import of these animals. They can't be bred very well in captivity, so they almost always have to be uh, captured in the wild, and they are endangered. I think several of the subspecies are, are have disappeared already because of this uh, medicinal use. So it's a uh, uh, it's a yeah it's a problem. But okay, John, you mentioned 
conspiracy theories, and there certainly are a lot around con uh, concerning the uh, the COVID-19. Uh, one that's going around a lot is that it is man-made, it is deliberate, it escaped from a lab. Now, uh, is there any reason to believe this, or what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, well, the the reasons that these conspiracy theories exist, it, it's almost it's almost inappropriate to call them conspiracy theories because we automatically dismiss things when we call them co conspiracy theories. And the reason I wouldn't want to totally dismiss those ideas is because we certainly can, uh, we do have the technology to take a virus that's infecting one species and transform it to infect humans. That technology exists. All the large countries, you know, uh, China, Russia, the United States, we've all had, uh, we've all designed bioweapons in the past. Oh. And it's actually very, it's not that hard. You. <laughs> Really, a, a, a moderately funded university could build a bioweapon out of a virus. And in fact, uh, back in, I think it was 2002, uh, polio was recreated by a, just in a laboratory at a university. Someone with the genome alone produced polio. And they just did it as an experiment mm -hmm. and they published it. And that's, that's when the U.S. government really freaked out about... Um, about bioweapons and how easy it was to make them. And so a bunch of mm -hmm. new laws changed. Um, I, we were already concerned with, with bioweapons in the past, but this, this really was a wake up call like, oh, and small, it, was, it wasn't a small university, but it was, you know, it's like, you can, you can make this at a university laboratory. This is insane. This is not, this is not acceptable. So that danger is always here now. It's always with us. Every time there's a virus outbreak, uh, the, military intelligence is immediately looking into the fact into the possibility that this might be a bioweapon so that is a real thing that's it's happening in our universe now uh yeah. but there was no there was no indication that this was a weapon so all of the all of the the militaries of the big countries in the world with with good intelligence none of them uh reported that, that there's evidence that this is a weapon. <laughs> we we elect our officials, we set up these governments. I think it's it's fair for us to just go ahead and trust our intelligence on this, right? Um, and a lot of people don't want to trust their government's intelligence. They, they, they don't find it trustworthy, but I mean, <laughs> to accuse another nation of building a weapon, that's a huge accusation. And I like to go by the, you know, innocent until proven guilty uh, philosophy for that. So we do not have solid evidence. We, we do not have publicly available evidence saying that this is a bioweapon. So it's really inappropriate to assume that it is. I mean, the other possibility that people have been saying is that maybe this is a, a laboratory leak. So in normal research of viruses, what we do is we'll find a virus in a bat or another animal and we want to study, we want to figure out how it works. Because we're actually, any virus that exists in a mammal could transfer over to a human through a spillover mm -hmm. event. And so virologists are interested in, in learning how all of these viruses work. And in particular, yep. we've been curious how these bat viruses work. Uh, there is a virology lab in Wuhan, which is actually where this virus broke out. And the reason that that lab exists is because there's a bunch of bats in that area that have coronaviruses that are dangerous to humans. So the, the laboratory was set up there. They're studying bats there. And one of the things that you have to do to study a virus that comes from a bat is you have to mutate it so that it works in mice. And we know how to do this. We're very good at doing this. We know, we know how to make that happen. So the technology to transfer a virus from one species to another using genetic modification, that technology exists. And because of that, there's this scare, like maybe this is a, a, a laboratory leak maybe some laboratory mutated this to study it and it mm. somehow infected one of the scientists and got out that way or uh, maybe it was unleashed on purpose by someone who didn't like their boss or didn't like their society you know there's all sorts of yeah. reasons ways that a virus could get out of a laboratory right I mean, there is a lot of uh, a lot of stuff I've I've seen on the internet and emails going around about. Do you realize that uh, very near the uh, the Wuhan market there is this this laboratory? And of course, they're they're sort of like connecting A to B yeah. to C, where it doesn't really exist. Well, well, I mean, it is true that, that laboratory exists there. So there is there is enough circumstantial evidence 
that this could be a lab leak, that people were very concerned with that, especially early on. And, uh, you know, so th that, that was a legitimate concern very early on. There's recently a paper put out, I believe it was in Nature, and I'll have to send you the link to that. Mm -hmm. But they, they, early on, people were, were trying to analyze the genome of this virus to see if it had signs of laboratory manipulation. Because uh, there, are, there are ways that we know how to transfer a virus from a, a bat to a mouse or from a mouse to a human. There are known ways that we can do this. So people were, were looking very intensely at this genome to see if there were any signs of human tampering, uh, of known tampering. And we actually have mm. uh, an, an AI that can analyze uh, the genome of any virus and see if, if any known uh, ah. genetic manipulation techniques were used on it. And it appears that this, well, this, this new paper in Nature says that no, there's no signs that known genetic tampering techniques were used to create this virus. And what that does, it doesn't completely mean that, that this was not a laboratory leak, but if it was a laboratory leak, it was not genetically modified by humans who were trying to make something that would infect humans. So it, it was not genetically modified by humans at all. It was either a, a one of the viruses that was uh, collected and was being kept at this laboratory that would have leaked, or mm. um, it could have, uh, you know, any time that you are in contact with a virus, any activity that you do that puts you in contact with an animal virus, gives it an, an opportunity to jump from an animal to a human. So just, it could have been, you know, people collecting bats, right, for research that got bit and so on and so mm. forth. So there are, I mean, it could have been, uh, it could have been lab work that was responsible for this spillover, or it could have been the, the meat industry that was responsible for this, this spillover. And it's, it's hard to tell, but we do, we have, there's very strong evidence that this was not genetically modified by humans, at least not using any known techniques. So that's where we're at right now. But of course, the conspiracy theorists uh, will say that uh, that paper in Nature is uh, is is all been uh, manufactured, <laughs> and the truth yeah. is being covered up. Because no matter what you say, they've got an answer for it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there is this general distrust of authorities, right? That I mean, all of us kind of have it, right? All of us. We don't want to fully buy hmm. what's what's being told by by authorities. I mean, you know. But the way that science works, a lot of people think that science works where there's there's this very rigid uh, system of of leaders that can tell subordinates what to do and to keep secrets and so on. That actually, I mean, that probably does exist in military um, mm. uh, research facilities, but in mainstream science, that does not exist. And the people who publish in Nature, uh, this is. This is the scientific community, which is a very diverse community. Everyone's getting their funding from different places. It is nearly impossible to keep a secret in the scientific community because a scientist makes a name for himself or for herself by discovering something, by revealing something that was currently, that was previously unknown. That's how you become a famous scientist. And so it's, it really is, uh, it is an error to think that the scientific community is going to keep a secret together. That's just not how things work in, in public science. So uh, yeah, th there's not, this paper that was published in science, it was an international effort to analyze this stuff. Um, early on, there was, a, there was also a, a, a preprint paper. So something that had not yet been peer reviewed Mm -hmm. saying that there was a link to this virus and HIV, which made the, the researchers suspect that this was genetically modified, that someone had, had taken a gene from HIV and inserted mm -hmm. it into a coronavirus to make it work on humans. And it was very clearly pointed out that this is not the case. The, the sequence that was similar to a, a sequence in HIV was super short. And by random chance, it exists in a bunch of different organisms, including a bunch of coronaviruses. 
again, coronavirus, it's a whole family of viruses. Um, so this, this sequence was so short that, yeah, it's found in HIV, but it's found in, in dozens of other organisms, including cor coronaviruses in the wild, naturally. And, it, you know, it was just look at the, uh, the database of coronaviruses that have already been sequenced. Their genomes have already been sequenced. And you mm -hmm. could find that, that that sequence was already known to exist in wild coronaviruses and bat coronaviruses. So that was a, you know, that, that was a, that was a dead end um, finding. It was very alarming to the, the, the people who, yeah. who found it. They're like, Oh my gosh, maybe this is a genetically modified uh, organism. And of course, uh, people who are scared that it's the people who don't trust scientists, they got a hold of that and they started spreading that on, you know, social media and so on that this was manipulated from HIV. And by the time the research was corrected, it was too late. That idea was, was already spreading like crazy. And so that, that idea is still going around strong, but it's, there's nothing to it. It's that has been thoroughly debunked at this point. And this can be very selective. I mean, science, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it goes into things like making soap. I mean, if if you're that distrustful of science, then don't use soap anymore. You know, who knows what they put in there? Right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, people, <sighs> the evidence, the vast majority of the evidence is pointing to this being nothing but a natural disaster. This is a natural disaster, you know? Mm. Um, I mean, you could, you could blame it on the meat market. You could blame it on um, uh, Chinese medicine. You could blame it on the airlines and, you know, I mean, all of that stuff has to do, I mean, that's all those things let this spread. Right. But this is a natural disaster. Uh, viruses spill over from animals to humans all of the time. And we, for some reason, we have a horrible time accepting that natural disasters happen. We want to assign blame. Yep. You and if you look at, here. yeah, I mean, look, look at how we used to think about disease. Diseases were caused by witches or by demons or by gods. We could not fathom that diseases just happened. Um, earthquakes. Because if you point the finger at somebody, you can, you can assign blame and maybe, I don't know, punish them. If it is, yeah, if it yeah. is something which is you know, I don't want to say random, but natural, that's chaotic. And that scares people, doesn't it? Yeah, it, it is terrifying. It is terrifying to know that just the universe can accidentally kill us, right? Like, there's no, um, there's no, no one's to blame for this, really. Uh, and I've, so, you know, I've got this animation up, and it's got millions of views. And I, I've got a very clear picture of the the ideas that people have about this, you know, the, the video is, is called where do new viruses come from and it, question mark. And so a lot of people mm -hmm. have, instead of watching oh the video, they God. just <laughs> respond in the comments immediately as to where they think the virus came from. And Without so I've gotten a very, video, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I've gotten a very clear picture of where people think this virus comes from. And, uh, people are just assigning blame to whichever group of people they hate the most. So I've got oh. people saying, Oh, it was created in a lab by the Israeli military. It was created by Donald Trump. It was created by the Democrats to ruin Donald Trump's reputation. It's um, it, it, it's a hoax by the media. People no longer say that. They, they were saying that when it, when it was still just in, in China and so on. Uh, a lot of people are blaming Chinese culture for this. And, you know, it is... Uh, we think that it came from this wet market, right? The, 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 the bulk of the evidence is pointing towards this wet market in China where this came from. And the wet market is where a lot of wild animals are sold. A lot of them are brought there alive. They're stacked in cages on top of each other. They're slaughtered on the spot and then um, given to the customer as meat. And this really is uh, an environment where spillover events can happen very easily because you've got a bunch of different species mixing. Some of them are alive. Some of them are dead. There's meat. There's a, there's slaughter. There's knives that are used on multiple species. Um, it really is a dangerous place for viruses to spread. But the last pandemic, if you remember, um, it, we weren't nearly mm. as scared of it back then, but it was the, uh, it was the, the swine flu. And the swine yes. flu came from the you know, American style meat markets, uh, the, 
the factory farming of pigs that was happening, it, it actually first broke out, we think, in Mexico. So America can kind of say, oh, no, it wasn't us. Uh, but it was... <laughs> It was the the standard, the the culture of raising pigs that started in the this 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 Western style factory farming that caused that pandemic. So we're not we're not innocent of these sorts of things. This is yeah. a this is a human problem. We the way that we the fact that our population is so big. You know, we're what what seven plus billion uh, people right now. Our population is so huge and we're so interconnected now with, with through flights and so on that these rare events when they happen I mean, they're inevitable even though they're rare there's so many of us and so many of us are eating animals and interacting with animals mm -hmm. that these spillover events are inevitable and when they happen they're going to spread all throughout the world because of our uh, international flights and even you know the first h1n1 pandemic this, often called mm. the Spanish flu that spread Spanish just flu. through boats. I mean, we were connected it well enough at the time that it was spreading just through the, through boat travel. So it's, um, this is a, this is just something that our species has to deal with. We're, we're going to have these, these issues and yeah. to blame it on Chinese culture. First of all, the wet market culture is just a subculture. It's not, it's not Chinese culture. It's a subculture within China. We also have people here in America that eat squirrels and turtles and all sorts of things. Um, yeah. it, and, uh, I think that, uh, we're going to see in the future, uh, China's already starting to crack down on this and, and make new laws, make new rules about, um, how we handle things at these wet markets. And I, I hope to see them clean things up there, but I hope, wow. I hope that everyone will just kind of take a look at what we're doing, how we're doing it. You know, our, the meat industry here in the U S I hope we, we take a look at that. I hope we, that all of the laboratories that deal with viruses, um, I hope that this little scare, that this, you know, the, the slight chance that this could have come from a laboratory, I hope that that scares us all enough to beef up security at laboratories and to you know, improve how things are, are working there. Um, and I hope that this makes us all a little, little bit more cautious about, uh, more aware of spillover, spillover events in, in general and the importance of shutting down travel quickly, shutting down, um, yep. you know, it, we were all slow at this, you know, um, I'm in Canada right now, but I'm an American and I was listening to Donald Trump say that this is not a big deal when I was already gambling my time, um, <laughs> you know, spending all of my time on making this video because I was fairly certain this was going to come here. Meanwhile, he was saying that it was going to go away miraculously in the summer. Um, he was saying other things like that. And I'm like, Ooh, I don't think that's what's going to happen. Um, and, yeah, and we now know that a bunch of American politicians who were getting uh, private uh, tutors on, on what, what, what was happening, they were all selling stocks like crazy before the stock market crashed. Um, so um, I was aware that this was going to be a problem. Well, I was mm. fairly certain this was going to be a problem, certain enough that I um, devoted all my time to it. Uh, politicians were certain enough that they were selling stocks and um, it in the future I hope <laughs> that we will take this more seriously and you know uh, this wasn't just Donald Trump brushing this off uh, politicians everywhere were doing this uh, and for good reason you don't want people to panic before there's reason to panic but we did we waited too long on this we should have shut down earlier we sh should have uh, we should have started social distancing earlier. But the, the crazy thing about that is if, if we were to have started social distancing earlier, shutting down companies and so on, not allowing people to go out to bars and, and all this, uh, we would have prevented a catastrophe and no one would have known that we prevented a catastrophe and people would have just been angry. Uh, so I think this is, <laughs> this you is how we learn. You have to go through it in order to, to learn. Yeah. 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 And, and, and there really is danger with this, these sorts of things in that uh, like you could use, you really could use a disaster like this to grab a bunch of power from your citizens. And so people are especially worried about this in Korea and in China. And like um, in, in Korea, there's an app that everyone has on their phones that follows them. 
and that allows the government to immediately find out if you get sick, who all of your contacts were. Mm. And, you know, that's an invasion of private, pretty huge invasion of privacy, right? Yeah. But I mean, we already let Google invade our privacy in that way. Google, Google knows where you've been if you have a Google phone. Um, and we do that not to prevent disease, but so that we can have uh, an app that tells us if the traffic's going to be bad, you know? Um, so we do give up our privacy for less than, than this, but it, it is a, there's a lot of interesting problems, um, a lot of interesting discussions to have around this. Like, how do we prevent this in the future? How, how angry should we really be at China for this coming from there? Um, I don't, I actually don't think that we should be upset with them. I think we should just, um, encourage them to make laws to clean up the, um, the the markets where we think this came from and uh move on i mean the only thing we can do here is really just work together to move on to stop this from happening in the future okay john thanks so much for coming back onto the show i will leave links to your youtube channels stated clearly as well as its sister channel stated casually in the description below plus all your social media links and all that's left to say is thank you once again uh for helping us all to stay curious yeah, uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on your show. I appreciate it.